Jane for giving up her time today to come and speak to you all, and also to Pat for putting me in touch with Jane, much appreciated. So I'll hand over and um, there will be some time at the end for questions as well. So my name is Jane Asher and I am a Chief Exec and Founder of an advertising agency that's called 23 Red. I started my career in 1985 and I did a degree in politics, philosophy and economics. Um, I was the product of two doctors and although I didn't go into medicine, I've always been really very interested in and engaged with health and public health in particular. Now, I first started working in the area of behaviour change way back in 1988, actually, before it was ever called behaviour change. And I worked on the government's uh, campaign to uh, stop or prevent drinking and driving. And that was my first exposure to this area, and I've been really interested and passionate about it ever since. And in 2000, I set up my own agency, which is really focused exclusively on positive behaviour change. So I work on a lot of different issues, um, an awful lot on health, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but I also work on things like financial inclusion, uh, digital inclusion, getting young people to vote, organ donation, blood donation, anything pretty much that's got a sort of positive uh, social benefit and where behaviour change is massively important. Uh, so that's what I do, that's what my agency does. Um, uh, I was asked here today to talk about one campaign that I work on in particular, which is called Change for Life, uh, which is a campaign which is all about tackling uh, obesity and childhood obesity uh, in particular. So um, what I was going to talk about today, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about Public Health England that now has responsibility for health prevention and what they do, um, a little bit about the vision for the campaign, um, some of the insight that we found out when we um, started working on it, which presented some real challenges for us, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we tackled those challenges, and in particular, the model that we apply to all our behaviour change campaigns, uh, and the, the movement, the social movement that supports them, that helps people to change behaviour in their communities. And then I picked off just one campaign just to show you how it all comes together. We do many campaigns a year tackling different issues, but I've just picked off one just to hopefully illustrate all the points I'm going to make. And then talk a little bit about how it's working. Uh, and you asked me also to talk a little bit about the future. Um, and it so happens I've got a planning meeting tomorrow on the future. So I'm happy to put my thoughts forward, but please at the end feel free. If you have some thoughts on where you think it needs to go next, I would uh, gratefully receive them. Uh, so, that's what I'm going to cover off. Um, Public Health England. So, in 2013, the Department of Health transferred responsibility for health prevention and protection into an organisation called Public Health England, and from the NHS into local authorities. So, it's a massive change in the landscape in terms of the responsibility for public health and health prevention. And um, Public Health in, uh, England, I think, have, there are two very important points to note about their mission and the ambition for Public Health England. The first point is that there is a recognition that health prevention is not about top-down and about the work that they do solely. It is about working to address inequalities in partnership. Uh, and so working with national and local, local government, working with the NHS, working with industry, working with academia, all of that is really important to tackle some of these major social issues. So that's the first key point about Public Health England. The second is that it is all about getting people to make small changes to improve their health. And we'll talk a bit more about that and what that means in the context of diet and obesity in a minute. So that's a bit about Public Health England, what they're responsible for and what some of the well, two key uh, points are, are in relation to their mission and their ambition, and you'll see that come through in the work I'm going to talk about. Uh, change for life. So, back in 2009-2010, I was the co-author of the original Change for Life uh, marketing strategy, which I have a copy somewhere, but you can download it online, and annually we report pr progress reports, actually updates, in terms of how we're doing. Uh, and it's a right riveting read, so I definitely recommend it. Um, so uh, the, the landscape uh, in, uh, at that time, uh, there was a very big insight report that had been published called the Foresight Insight Report. But basically, at its heart, it said that 
one in three, thirty percent of children were in primary school age, key stage one, obese. And so this actually, in terms of the long term health outcome for UK PLC, is a crisis, you know, potentially a long term public health crisis. These young children are going to go up, grow up with obesity, they're going to die earlier uh, because of long term conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, etc. So uh, it was, language was used, uh, 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 calling it a crisis, and I think it absolutely, totally is a crisis that, that, that we have in relation to childhood obesity. So, um, in 2009-10, the government published a strategy called Healthy Weight, Healthy Lives, and it talked about lots of different levers, and there are lots of different levers that government can pull to, to tackle something like obesity, from taxation, and of course we've all recently heard about the sugar tax, uh, which I think is really important and good and is symbolic, um, and really putting the focus, I think, on, on sugar. Uh, through to regulation, legislation, reformulation, a lot of targets set in terms of reformulation, whether that be around salt, sugar, fat, etc. Um, this piece of work sits alongside all those different levers and starts to pull them together, and that's about building a social marketing campaign, and that's what we set out to do in 2009-10. So, um, the vision for Change for Life, and a little like, I talked about what the, the ambition and vision was for Public Health England, is to inspire a social movement through which government, NHS, local authorities, businesses, charity schools, etc., etc., can all play a part in changing children's diet and physical activity behaviours. Uh, and that's massively important. So we talk about change for life as being a, a sort of social movement. Um, and it is very much about, at its core, it is about families of children aged 5 to 11. So what we're seeking to do is to improve those health outcomes, life chances for those children um, at that age. Um, when we set about uh, developing the strategy, um, we c conducted lots of research, about 18 months worth of research, using all sorts of different types of research techniques, from ethnography to qual to quant to all, all sorts of different research techniques, to really build a picture of what the challenges were that we were going to face in tackling childhood obesity. And the first thing to say is obesity is massively complex. It's not like smoking. Smoking is simple, stop. Actually, some, some people, it's not that simple to stop. I can talk about that too. But, uh, but actually, obesity is about diet behaviours, it's about physical activity behaviours. Um, being overweight, as I've said, increases the ch uh, chance that children will die younger than their parents because of things like diabetes, heart disease, cancer. But people don't make that connection. You know, if you talk to parents, and certainly at that time, people were not making the connection between obesity and something so far into the future. That was a real challenge for us. You know, how did we say to parents, how did we get that message across that actually your diet has that health impact, can have that health impact? Um, what we also found out, obesity of course is a really a function of modern society. We are hugely lucky that we have an abundance of food, it's cheap, it's convenient, you know, convenience food is absolutely great, you know, you come back late from work, you can chuck something in the oven or the microwave and there it is, absolutely brilliant. Um, we enjoy all the benefits of transportation and we can lounge on our sofas, multi-screening and having great entertainment without even getting our butts off the sofa. All that is absolutely fantastic and wonderful, but it does have a negative consequence. And that was massively important for us, that insight, particularly alongside another insight, which is mum felt really beleaguered. So when, you, uh, when we talk to mothers about the issue of childhood obesity, they're going, oh, honestly, it's not my fault, please don't blame me. You know, mum was sort of the source of all issues and the, the, sorry, the person responsible for putting it right. It's really difficult, really challenging. So we needed to find an enemy. So we couldn't blame mum. We knew that if we blamed mum at that time for the issues around childhood obesity, we wouldn't get mum's support in trying to tackle them. So this insight here around modern society was massively important for us because we had an enemy. We said, you know what, you've got lots of great things you've benefited from in modern society. You know what, there's some bits of it that aren't so great too. So that was a very, very important insight and started to shape our thinking in terms of the terms Campaign. Um, what 
it also shown us is that people's attitudes, so not just as it complex in itself, but that people's attitudes towards it were very, very complex. And so when we talked to people, they said, you know, obesity is a real issue, but it's not my issue. So, you know, we would show people the sort of front covers of what was in those days, I think, called the News of the World, but doesn't exist anymore, or the Sun, and you would see a picture of a, a morbidly obese child, and parents would look and go, oh, God, that's awful. What a dreadful, dreadful parent. That's not me, and that's not my family. So we had a real challenge there about how to get people to engage and realise, actually, do you know what? It is all our issue. It's not somebody else's issue. Um, parents, I'm not sure it's just parents, I think we all do this one, don't we? Underestimate the amount of food we eat and overestimate the amount of exercise that they undertake. And that again for us was a sort of challenge, you know, we would say things like, you know, really children should be doing 60 minutes, active minutes, outside of the school day. And parents go, oh, of course my child does that, absolutely. But the, you know, the reality is they're overestimating. One of the other challenges we faced is that some behaviours which are really unhealthy, such as sedentary behaviours, so sitting down and lying down, are not perceived to have any risk. Research shows that if we just stood up more than we sat down, there would be a health benefit. Can you imagine a campaign saying that? People would look and laugh at us because it just seems that people don't believe that there is any harm in those sedentary behaviours. So that's you know, one of the other challenges we faced. Um, Parents were prioritising immediate happiness over long-term health. So people would say, my child's happy, they're healthy. Happy equals healthy. Uh, and, you know, my child's happy because, you know, I can afford to buy them the latest PS2 and drive them to school in my 4x4 and, you know, don't have to walk to school or whatever else, but, you know, they're perfectly happy. Uh, and so we have a, had a real sort of, you know, issue there about trying to explain to parents uh, why health matters and why health can contribute, obviously, to a child's and it's massively important to a child's happiness. Um, and last but by no means least, and this is one of the most difficult creative tasks I think I've ever worked with, is parents don't obviously reject their child being called obese. In fact, you'll see that in the press every so often. Uh, the National Child Measurement Programme, which is a programme that runs in primary schools to measure children. Uh, 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 their BMI as they go into school and they come out of school and every so often people are really affronted you know the, the local authority has written to me and told me that my child is you know obese and, 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 and they're being labelled and, and etc so for us that was massively massive but we couldn't use the word obese we couldn't use the word fat and yet we're doing, doing a campaign on obesity so you know really 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 challenging um, and where we got to, and you'll see it come through in the work that I show you, is we talked about the impact of fat in the body and on the organs. And that helped us then to make some of the links between the long-term health harms, so cancer, diabetes and heart disease, etc. So we had a really fine tightrope to walk in terms of the language that we used in developing this campaign. There were masses and masses of don'ts in it, and very few do's. Um, so it was quite a challenge. Um, when we came to talk very specifically about the behaviours, the behaviours that, are, uh, that we were trying to change, um, we, we faced another challenge really, is that the difference between unhealthy and healthy diets and between unhealthy and healthy activity levels is relatively small. You know, it, it, it is about moderation, isn't it? People say there's nothing that's intrinsically bad for you, it's about how so that is very difficult as well to communicate because it isn't as simple as don't do this or do do that. Um, so the very, very small changes that we that, that, that make a difference. Um, and uh, what we also uncovered is that the, the healthier options were seen as being unappealing. Uh, you know, my child won't like the taste of it, for example, if you're talking about the diet behaviours. So it was absolutely a classic one. Um, expensive, there is a perception that eating healthily is more expensive uh, than eating on, you know, convenience food or, uh, um, you know, or 99p McDonald's. You know, God, I can feed my family full for, you know, less than five quid by going to McDonald's or so. Um, that it's seen as being inaccessible, and that's about availability. Um, and also about being seen as unachievable. You know, it's an aspiration, it's a middle class goal, isn't it? 
Um, and actually, one of the real challenges we've got, although it is not universally the case that the audiences most impacted are lower social demographic audiences, there are some segments which transcend. There is certainly an issue in lower social demographic groups where we have a had a loss of, um, of, of you know cooking skills and confidence and. Um, you know, so that's that. that there, there are issues uh, 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 there, definitely. Um, so we had to turn that around to, what, to to make sure that what we were doing was going to be appealing and attractive, was going to be affordable, uh, was going to be accessible, and going to be achievable. So um, what I've tried to do here is just to give you a flavour for some of the insights and the challenges that we faced when we were developing the campaign. Um, Public Health England's ambition and vision was all around coalitions and behaviour change. And therefore, in regard to change for life, we have a behaviour change model and a model for the coalition that we seek to build. So um, when we set about developing behaviour change models, there are masses of theoretical models, and if there are any, anybody doing psychology here, you know, you'll know lots of them. Um, and they're great theoretical models, but usually when you start, and you start with one, you then sort of evolve over time to develop a model that is absolutely right for the challenge that you face. Um, this is the model that has evolved over time, actually, in which we now place at the heart of all the campaigns um, that we develop in relation to Change for Life. And so we obviously need to motivate people um, and the, picking up on some of the insight challenges that I have referred to earlier, the first thing we had to do was to reframe the issue. We had to find a way to get them to engage. And so what we did, I've talked about one of the things we did to reframe the issue, which was to talk about the impact of fat on the, ins on the organs within the body, as opposed to making it cosmetic. That was the first thing we did to reframe the issue. We also started to make the links between the behaviours and the potential long-term health harms. I'll show you in a minute precisely how we did that. And we found quite an interesting stat in the early days, which is that actually um, children were likely to live nine years less than their parents um, and die nine years earlier from those diseases if they carried on the way that they were. So um, we're quite an interesting, and you can see again how that came to, to life in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> we also needed to drive self-awareness and identification. So we did a, um, a, a every, at every opportunity, we get people to, to hand raise and to get involved and to benchmark their behaviours. So we did, for example, a big national survey called How Are the Kids, where we got parents to um, just benchmark their kids' behaviours. You know, you know, how's little Johnny and Jackie at you know, five a day? And, you know, uh, um, and walking to school and various other really simple behaviours and we sent them back a sort of personalised plan saying, you know, Johnny's doing great at this but he could do a bit more of that and, you know, etc. Et but we had to find a way to get parents and to get children involved. Mm -hmm. um, we then move around uh, and it's all about um, activation and this is very much now where the campaign is focused. So. This piece here about personalisation and reframing the issue was in the beginning when people were very unaware of those links. Now we really, really focus on the behaviours and getting people to change behaviours. And what we found has worked here, in the first instance, is, is, is um, making the behaviours really simple and chunking them. So things like five a day, cut back on fat, um, sugar swaps, knee size meals, uh, fibre swaps, you know, things that people can actually really understand and and not go into too much of the science. And you'll tell me, you'll talk to me about fat, and you'll go, oh, yes, but you know, it's really sat fat. And I, I know that, and we know that, but the point is that for the person we're trying to talk to, that's just a whole load of detail that they don't need to know. Really, their diet will be much better if we could get them just to cut back on a bit of fat in their diet. So we try to keep it at a really simple level for people to understand what it is that they need to do. And we also get people to make a commitment. We find um, that if people make a commitment to change their behaviour, in fact some of the evidence from the campaign I'm going to show you bears this out, that uh, they are far more likely to be successful. So that's a very important part of what we do. They, so if they commit and they make a plan, they are more likely to be successful. Uh, and then of course we monitor uh, and we provide feedback loops so we let people know how they're getting on. 
Uh, and we also reward. So incentivization is an important part of getting people to change their behavior in this, uh, in this area in terms of diet and physical activity. So that's the behavior change model that we apply to all our campaigns. I talked about the coalition. So this is not a, about a top-down public health information campaign. Uh, you'll see Change for Life popping up everywhere, you know, in, in your local booths, in your local pharmacy, in your local sports centre, in your school, through the book bags, all sorts of places, and that is quite deliberate. That is because it needs to be everywhere, and Change for Life is all about supporting people wherever and where, whenever they need that support to change their behaviour. So we work with all the major retailers, you know, Asda, Tesco, Co-op, Aldi, Lidl, we work with all the independents, we work with the food manufacturers. Very interesting working with the food manufacturers actually, and probably worth a word on that, which is when we started putting this coalition together, and we've also got charities in it you'll see as well, uh, when you bring together charities in the food industry, you can expect fireworks. Um, and right at the beginning, these guys were kind of saying, I'm not working with the food industry on this. You know, they are the devil. Absolutely, we can't possibly work with them. Uh, and it took us quite some time to, to say to people, look, you know, this is not a perfect world. The food industry has responsibility here in terms of helping and supporting people to change behaviour. And there is some stuff that the food industry has done and is doing and will increasingly have to do in terms of reformulation that is good. And they are part of the solution. Therefore, we worked through a set of guidelines um, uh, with the food industry and with charities to say, look, would you be happy? We need to work with the food industry in these areas. Uh, and so we drew up a set of guidelines based on sort of nutritional criteria profiling and said, right, okay, these are the categories that we are prepared to work with because they are really important to helping us change behaviours. Um, and we work with all the media, so you know, quite often you'll see some bit of change for life in you know, Betty's Hot Pot or wherever it is in Coronation Street and stuff like that. It's all massively important because it's part of, you know, culturally, you know, how do we make it more acceptable, how do we make it part of um, our culture. Uh, the NHS, schools, um, everybody has got a role to play in change for life. And we currently work with about 214 different commercial organisations on change for life. And at grassroots level, we've got 70,000 local supporters. So they could be teachers, NHS, local community and voluntary groups, just people who've hand-raised. It might not be their day job, but part of what they have responsibility for is ch the health of children, and physical activity and diet. And we provide them with all the resources and the tools that they need to be able to support children in schools, for example, in changing their behaviours. So it's quite a big, too, big piece of sort of infrastructure, if you like, that sits behind us. So, that's the sort of theory about what we set out to do. What I've got is one campaign which I've tried, as I said, I've tried to pick one that demonstrates a whole range of these things uh, coming together. So, uh, and I picked a campaign which is called Smart Swaps. Um, and uh, so, uh, Smart Swaps was born out of the, uh, of the um, uh, PhD nutrition team. Uh, talking to us about the, the single biggest contributors to calorific intake in children. Incidentally, we don't talk about calories, and people might wonder why we don't talk about calories. It's because, um, first of all, calories are challenging in relation to children, obviously, because really what we're trying to do with children is maintain healthy weight, um, and secondly, there's an awful lot of sort of con confusion and consumer confusion around, uh, around calories. So we focus on very simple things like sugar swaps, fat swaps, and then we usually, in the work that we do, link back into calories, but we don't lead with calories for those, uh, those reasons. So anyway, uh, it was sugar and fat. If we could make an impact, sugar and fat, we really needed to get a, um, uh, the nation behind uh, uh, how important these, these, these were. Uh, this was in 2014. Since 2014, we started to focus on sugar, and so now sugar is everywhere. But you know, we started working on sugar in that way and really highlighting the issues with sugar back in 2013-14 when we started this work. Obviously, this takes time for all the momentum's building and coalitions getting behind it. So, um, what did we? Uh, uh, what were our insights from the development of this campaign? So we did, um, as we were pulling it together, and, and we rely a lot on, on research. We did some research and. Um, what research showed us is that um, showing visually what's inside food helps to drive motivation. So 
If you say to people, a, you know, a can of cola's got, or a bottle of cola's got, whatever it's got, 13 cubes of sugar, people can't, so, but you actually physically show them, people go, oh my God, can you believe how much sugar is in a can or a bottle of, um, of fizzy, sugary fizzy, fizzy drink? Um, so the first thing that we did was to say, right, we are actually going to visualise that, everything, sugar and fat, we are going to show parents how much is in um, everything. Um, the next thing that, that we can uh, uh, uncover is that people don't want to stop, and indeed we're not really asking them to stop, it's the point that I made earlier, it's not that a food's particularly intrinsically bad for you, it's just how much of it you're actually consuming. Um, but what we want people to do is to make a like-for-like -like swap. And so what we focused on in this campaign is those categories where they can make a like-for-like -like swap. So fizzy drinks is a really good example. There are sugary fizzy drinks, but there are also um, non, no or low sugar fizzy drinks. And there are other options, you know, um, juices, cordials, water, which is what we'd all prefer. But we were really mindful. This, we have to be pragmatic. We are not going to get somebody who consumes several cans of Coke a day to drink water. It just ain't going to happen. So we have to be practical and we have to make sure that what we're doing is signposting them to lower so that we can get them on a journey. Um, swaps made repeatedly over time are more likely to embed and again the evidence sort of says you know, it takes time in terms of the palate as well to, um, you know, to, to appreciate the, the, the change in taste for example and to get used to it. So for us it, was, it wasn't just about getting people to try something once but trying to get them to stick with a swap. Uh, and but building on the same point, long-term change requires maintenance. Um, and calories are important, but they need to be handled with care. I've explained why and how we handle uh, the question of uh, calories in these campaigns. Uh, so, the initiative we developed, we said, right, we just want people to sign up uh, and choose. Remember I said commitment is very important. One or more easy swaps that can be made every day and support them in maintaining those swaps for a month. That's what we set out to do. Um, so, uh, and we had a number of campaign imperatives, uh, going back to this whole thing about feeling like a movement, feeling like everybody else is doing it, social norming, you know, I'm, I'm not the odd one out. Uh, really important that it felt like a, a movement for swapping <coughs> and that everybody's doing it. Um, understanding existing shopping behaviour in order to break down ingrained habits. So. Uh, when we're going around the supermarket, I'm sure we're all pretty much the same, you know what you want, you've been around that supermarket before, the hand just automatically reaches for what you've always reached for before. So it was very, very important for us that we had all the retailers doing something at that point that was going to get people to change. So um, re-ranging and what they did in terms of their promotional materials at point of sale was massively important to us because that was the point that where people would make that change. Um, and creating a clear role for registration in the programme uh, and activity to drive consumers to it. So I mentioned at the beginning about how important it is that people sign up and make a commitment. Um, so that's what we needed to do. Uh, oh gosh, very complicated customer journey and the typeface has gone a little wobbly here. But I think uh, I'm going to go into talk about some of these elements in more detail in a minute. But um, we have... Uh, a range of media channels which will drive awareness of the campaign and we use uh, a combination of television, uh, outdoor posters, uh, radio, uh, digital channels uh, in order to make people aware. And we are driving them to sign up, they sign up uh, on a registration page. What they get for signing up is a lovely little pack, a smart sort pack. Um, and I'll come into a minute on what that pack includes. Uh, they then make a commitment. So you remember I said how important it is. They go, which, which one are you going to do? Well, actually, I'm going to make a commitment for a month to swap out sugary fizzy drinks. Or I'm going to make a commitment to um, uh, swap to healthy, healthy breakfast uh, or whatever the range of swaps are. Um, we then uh, uh, are, they are then supported in store. I mentioned already how important it is that we are disrupting their purchasing habits in store. We encourage people to share their commitments on social media um, and then we also keep supporting them during the course of the campaign. So we keep going back to them doing, doing a really great job. Here are a few more incentives. Have you tried this? Uh, perhaps you might want to try another swap. So keeping that, uh, that dialogue uh, going. 
um, the tools, um, things really help people. You know, just getting something into people's hands. Every campaign we run, massively, massively important. So um, we had a smart swap out. It's a really, really nice, little bit of cardboard engineering actually, which is, you know, had your usual sort of snack on it, uh, and, uh, and you spun it around and you said, well, why don't you try this? Which is just a healthier alternative. Really nice little piece. Uh, we had fridge magnets, really important because as you're reaching for the fridge, that's another point of uh, consumption. So you can see what we're trying to do is to be near the points of influence, purchase, behaviour change, consumption, to remind people of the messaging. And last but by no means least, the incentives that we have here, uh, which is giving people, which the manufacturers and the retailers getting involved, to get people to try the healthy alternative. Um, talked a little bit about the media selection overall, but each individual channel has a very specific role to play in the whole campaign. So um, the, the uh, TV advertising is about driving awareness and, and, uh, and um, uh, registration. Uh, the 30 second um, radio ads contextualizing, so really important breakfast radio when we're talking about what you can do to swap to have a you know, healthy breakfast, for example. Um, the nudge, very important in the supermarket, in the retail environment. And social media is the whole sort of reinforcing social norming, everybody's doing it. Piece. So very clear roles there. Um, what I'm going to show you now, hopefully, is um, the TV ad, and it sh I think it demonstrates the various points that I've made on route. So it will, you'll see how we talk about fat in the body. You will see how we talk about raising awareness of the links between the behaviours and the long-term health harms. You will see how we bring industry with us because it's actually a healthy ad break and we have various industry advertisers being part of it as well. So, hopefully... We look, Pop, but Mum says we need to make some healthy swaps, starting with those sugary drinks. She says we need to see what's brewing in them. Direct marketing, what they were doing in the store, 
um, all the offers that they made available um, at the um, at point of sale. Um, local authorities, really important. So we had participation here from 152 local authority areas uh, around the around the country, um, and for us. This is really, it's not the glamorous end of what we do, but this kind of stuff is really, really important. As is this, what we do in schools. So getting all of these campaigns into primary schools, linked to the national curriculum, massively important to change behaviors. And what's really interesting, consistently, um, we put our campaigns into the book bags that come through from um, the schools. And it is the book bag is the most successful sign-up mechanism for Change for Life. So it's hugely powerful, the power, the importance of teachers and the power of children as change makers in a family is really, really important. Um, in terms of the results for the campaign, um, the, IT, the ITV Healthy outbreak, which you saw, uh, which I showed you, it actually uh, screened in January in the first uh, outbreak of Corrie, uh, had 7.7 .7 million people viewing it. Loads of PR coverage for the campaign, which is fantastic. Lots of visits to the website, loads of people downloading apps and requesting smart swappers. 400,000 families registered with the campaign. And this, now we get to the really important stuff. 75% of those who signed up to the campaign stuck like glue to their swap. In other words, they stuck with it, which was the whole point about embedding the behavior. And most importantly, we track year-on-year -year sales, category sales of the healthier options versus the less healthy options. And what we saw with this campaign is that there was a staggering reduction in the purchasing of sugary drinks for um, sugary colas, um, etc., and a corresponding increase in the zero diet versions of it. So, and for us. That is massively important that we are starting to change the behaviours that will lead to obesity. Um, in terms of the campaign overall, it's been running now since 2009. Uh, the goal that was set at the beginning was about reducing the rising tide of childhood obesity by 2020. So, you know, we've still got quite a long way to go. How are we going on that journey? I think what we can safely say is that we have achieved a number of things. We are engaging mum. So there are very high levels of awareness of change for life. I'm sure most of you, all of you probably in this room will be aware of it just through day-to-day -day lives, aside from the fact that obviously it's a core part of the course that you're studying. Um, and 95% of mums now associate it with, with healthy eating. You know, it is now seen as the healthy eating, healthy lifestyle brand, which is great. We have about 2 million families who've joined up and who are on our database, who we work with, who we're supporting and changing behaviour. Many, many more will be doing so, but not having joined us formally, but through what they've seen and the exposure they get through local authorities and schools and through the retailers. Um, we have a chain of change for life sports clubs associated with primary schools. Um, 220,000 um, uh, kids um, participating uh, there, um, and, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, and we do a lot of tracking on that, and we can see that we have more children uh, doing more 60-minute uh, physical activity, which is great. And our most recent campaign, which you may well be aware of, which ran just, just um, for the last couple of months, is um, about Sugar Smart. So it's absolutely totally zeroing in on sugar, and we launched an app, very, very simple app actually, uh, which was about um, uh, helping uh, a mum to understand how much sugar is in the food uh, that she buys. Um, and we have had two million, over two million downloads of that app. So massively, massively successful, really useful tool uh, to help people to understand you know, how much, just how much sugar uh, is. Uh, uh, so that's engaging the nation. Are we actually changing behaviour? And che measuring changing behaviour is very, very difficult, actually, um, because there are big differences between what people claim and what they actually do. So we run tracking studies all the time, and people will tell us that they've changed behaviour. We need to try to actually evidence that behaviour change. We do it in a number of different ways, by getting people to keep food diaries, for example, by tracking category sales data as well to see how 
uh, behaviours have changed. And in the case of physical activity by uh, running accelerometry um, uh, 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 t tests as well with certain um, cells, groups of people, who, who children who are on the Change for Life, uh, any of the Change for Life campaigns. So we do physical activity generally in the summer, and we do diet generally in January, that seems to make sense. And we also have an always on program. Um, but we are seeing real changes in behavior. So I haven't taken you through 10 Minute Shape Up, which is the Disney um, inspired partnership that we run every summer, but we are actually seeing increases, real increases in children's physical activity as a result of it, which is fantastic. And that whopping great big um, uh, number that I talked about in terms of the reduction, equated to 8.6% reduction in purchasing of carbonated sugary drinks. So we are starting to see some changes in terms of the um, behaviours in relation to diet and physical activity. Um, it's a long-term, long slog, to be honest. Uh, what we're seeing in terms of the stats, uh, and actually that's sort of borne out, I haven't added in actually, uh, 1450, is that, is that the stats appear to have plateaued. Um, I'd love to claim it was all down to this campaign, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm sure not, but it, but it is recognised as being a, you know, a contributor, which is fantastic. We obviously have a long way to go, and it is a very much a focus of the current uh, government, Childhood Obesity, um, and the government is shortly to publish uh, its next obesity strategy. Uh, Change for Life uh, is a, a, a very, very, it will be a very important strand of that, of that strategy. Um, it's definitely something that has succeeded in getting everybody engaged and involved and what, how we notice this most is um, the shift in the funding models so when we launched change for life here it was largely funded by government i think the first three years was 75 million pounds went into change for life and we see is that over time industry has picked up that through all the sorts of examples of work that i talked about earlier on uh, and that's obviously uh, uh, considered to be quite a success that actually People, industry, charities, schools, and just realise that actually they have a role to play, um, and that's really important for us. We track. I mean, I go, go back to the importance of schools and the NHS and local supporters. Um, uh, Change for Life currently is it probably we do regular audits, but it's in about 50 to 60 percent of local community um, venues. You know, as I say, when you go into to, to your local sports club or your town hall or your, you know, it's, it's usually a change of life no sport in the GP surgery or, or whatever, you know, it's there, it's present, it's in the community and that's great and that's something the central government's not paying for, it's because people have picked up the assets, the assets are all open source and are really working with the, with the campaign. Um, where next? Um, as I said at the beginning, we've got a meeting tomorrow to, to discuss that. Um, I think it's, it's, um, you have to constantly refresh campaigns like this and you have to constantly find new and innovative things to do or new enemies to talk, to talk about or uh, new ideas uh, to keep it fresh. So we will definitely be looking at how we re-energise it. Um, I think there's something very exciting in here in the power of the change maker. So the power of kids and how that's starting to change family behaviours in the importance of teachers, for example, in changing behaviour, the role that the leaders in industry have played in terms of reformulation, and some of the moves, you know, Mars in the last few weeks have looked again at their labelling and uh, on, on things like pasta sauces and stuff, which is great, you know, to make it clear to people that actually these things are treated and they're pretty bloody high in, in, in things like you know, salt, sugar, etc. Um, so I think picking on, on that whole sort of change maker piece, I think it's probably something we'll do and we'll do more of. But Change for Life will be around for a very long time, helping people to change their behaviours. And um, uh, we won't know for a while yet whether we succeed in tackling childhood obesity, but we're on the right trajectory. Um, you know, we are starting to change the behaviours that contribute towards obesity. And if you want any more information, uh, go to the Change for Life website. There is a whole section on there called Local Supporters, all our research, all our evidence, everything, all the tools, all the materials, everything you can get hold of. Um, so, there you go. Thank you very much, everybody. That was absolutely fantastic. So interesting to get the background of information. Um, and James said that... Yeah, take
questions for anybody still? Any questions? At all? Any um, jo, thank you very much. It's also uh, very interesting. Um, just to pick up on the points that you raised about the, the government funding, etc., and then obviously there's been a, a recent shift, if you say, you know, to more, more business. But uh, with you say that you, you kind of look at it at school levels, I'm thinking more kind of like a, like a children's centre where the families are accessed. Mm -hmm. It's well documented that governments are currently cutting budgets left, right, and centre in order, and those services are suffering. So therefore, do you see it potentially suffer? program suffering as a result of that? Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's a tough economic environment and local authorities clearly, their budgets are coming under huge pressures and they're having to make cuts. I mean, I think you're probably referring specifically to things like Shore Start Centres, yeah. which are, you know, are, are fantastic resources um, there and they are, they are declining. I, uh, it, it, I think there are other channels that we, that we do and we need to use and working with local authorities to reach families. Um, and we have to get cleverer and better at how we use them and we have to recognise that, that locally there is a loss of skills and a loss of resources to support initiatives like this. So um, we are, um, to, to, to plug that kind of gap in terms of supporting families uh, and early years, starting to work a lot more with um, early years um, uh, 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 providers and nurseries, working more with local authorities um, and what's very interesting is the move actually into Public Health England was great news for Public Health because putting the Public Health Director into the local authority means actually they're pretty central to some of the decisions that are being made. So it's starting to have an impact on things, other areas, whether that be around sort of, you know, transport, housing, um, planning, all those kinds of things and, and starting to, or trying to embed public health in all those, in, in all those areas. Um, schools, again, another way in which we try to plug that gap, and through the wraparound services in schools too, through so things like schools, uh, the uh, sports clubs that I talked about, preschool clubs, the breakfast clubs, which a lot of them are now funded by industry, but working with industry as to what we can do through the breakfast clubs. So yes, you are right, the network is under a lot of pressure, um, but we, you know, doesn't stop us trying to find different ways to get in there because we absolutely recognise the only way we're going to tackle this is by working with grassroots you know, organisations that can help us in changing, in, in changing behaviour. So, but yeah, good question. I was just going to ask, just following on from that, do you think there's any way we could utilise the, the, the growing sort of silver army of OAPs? They, they have a lot of knowledge now. Um, well, a lot to do, I've like, obviously, in post-war Britain, and we you know diets are pretty healthy, and then people generally are not healthier. Is there some way you could possibly engage those people who are retired with, with younger people? I think that is a brilliant, brilliant idea, absolutely. I mean, and so we've done a little bit of work in that area by working with um, an organisation, you probably know Mumset and Grandsnet, um, little bits of work, but I think it's a really, really important point. Um, and uh, it, not only the skills there, um, but also you know some of the sort of you know the relationships between you know, grandparents and 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 and, uh, and grandchildren. So um, I think that's a I think it's a really good idea. I did ask for ideas at the end, so I'll take that one away. But I think you know absolutely really good really good thought. Any other questions? Um, I just wanted to ask you about your communication with maybe some celebrities like Benny Oliver or uh, someone like this because I know that he's leading um, also his own way of education for children about healthy eating but I don't know whether you have some celebrities. Yeah, we do and, and in fact, uh, and in fact we, have, we uh, work with Jamie would be putting, because Jamie doesn't work with people, Jamie is an agitator so, and, a, and a brilliant one um, but uh, so um, we, we do work w with uh, celebrities. We'd never pay celebrities. It's because they believe this is massively important, and they will tend to be you know celebrity mums who you know feel it's really important and very very happy to get involved. Um, Jamie specifically, um, I think it, it, he you know it's, it, it's well known. He, he he is he is an agitator. You know he was the person who was out there going you know should attack should attack. And the reality is, I do think it's 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 a symbolic gesture because at the end of the day he's saying it's not really about the revenue of sugar tax toy. it's not you know it's not a revenue generator like for example tax on tobacco is a, is a revenue generator 
But it is about focusing people's minds on the fact that we have to do something you know, differently uh, and that sugar really is um, uh, an issue that we have to tackle as, as a nation. So I think he's fantastic. Uh, I think we will probably, when I talk about what comes next, I think we will end up doing more work with Jamie, but um, he will always be his own, um, his own boss. Um, yeah. Yep. You know how you said about the money that's coming from the government and the money coming from the private? Mm -hmm. Was that percentages and or are the government giving less money? So you see what I mean? yes, I, I do. So the, the so government has more re private money yeah. or have the government no. reduced. The so money? government's government's reduced its uh, its its spend, mm -hmm. uh, which it's had you know had to. There's yeah. been a pressure on on across uh, across government on on spend. Uh, and industry has increased its spend. Um, so yes, absolutely driven by um, you know pressure on, on government budgets. But but I think quite quite right. It is all of our responsibilities yeah. to impact on it. You know, it is not just government's job to tackle obesity. Government cannot do it alone. So um, I, I think it, it's right that, that industry should be investing in this way. Sam. I just have a quick question. You mentioned before about the obviously campaign specifically for families and for yeah. sort of the 5 to 11. Yeah. And you, you mentioned previously about potentially, although you've got this many, uh, you know, it's two, uh, two, two, however many million people you've got yeah. signed up. Yeah. Is there any way, and uh, this is, you're going to, I know the answer you're going to give me, but I'm going to ask yeah. it anyway. Is there any way of getting a handle on the actual, you know, the, outside of the people that are signed up? Any idea of uh, what the wider ramifications are, not just about the families, but actually, is it affecting university students? Is it affecting, you know, actually, are those campaign messages getting out to other people? Is there any way of getting a handle on how much of an effect that's having? Yes, I mean, it, there, 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 there are multiple questions you've Sorry. Sorry. What you said there, actually, which is interesting. So, just to answer your question, beyond our two million families are people engaged, yes. I should, we run a tracking study, uh, which is. Um, uh, just checking, which is a representative sample across uh, across the country, uh, which shows that we have, and I think the stat was up there, seventy five percent awareness amongst mums. Mm -hmm. So that is that's that, that's that's national. So we know that the awareness and the engagement, uh, and in fact, actually, that tracking study also then drills down and looks at you know how uh, how many people are making the link between the health harms and the behaviours, and how many people are claiming changes in behaviours, etc. So we do know that we are having an impact on the nation overall. The two million is quite important to us because that's where we can act, track the actual changes in behaviour. So, so, that's, that's what, so we do reach them. Um, does it reach people in universities? And what happens what to the rest of the population? It's not five to 11 and a parent. So uh, we have another campaign uh, which launched actually in, it was very recently in, uh, in, um, uh, in March, which is called One You. Uh, which is a campaign which is uh, about adult uh, health. Uh, it's taking a different tack, really, to um, Change for Life, which focuses really on diet and physical activity behaviours. And that's because the challenge is different. A lot of the issues are interrelated in adult life. So we have a lot of behaviours around sleep and stress and alcohol and diet and physical activity that are all interrelated. So it's a campaign that is much broader um, and uh, uh, is tackling the other issue we have, particularly actually in the sort of 40 to 60 year old where we have a real, that's an, another sort of time bomb in terms of ill, Ill health. But, uh, so there are other things that we are doing. Uh, students, we have a student campaign which is called Rise Above. Again, has a, there are a lot of interrelated behaviours between smoking, drugs, uh, sexual health, diet, physical activity, so we take a slightly different tack there, um, again, uh, with, which is much more about uh, influences and blogging and uh, programming and that kind of approach, very different approach. I, mean, I know you, sort of, you miss out from the sort of eight years and above for the ones that haven't got from, but if you catch them before, yeah, it's a shame for you guys, you missed it all. Well, but right, you, look yeah, what, we, you look at yeah. what they know now, to the, the youngsters, you talk to an eight-year-old about five a day and yeah. sugar swaps and things like that, and they just know it all. Yeah. Some of them know more vegetables at that age than I know now. 
because they just learn about it and they want to know about vegetables and fruits and things because of five a day campaigns. Yeah. It's fascinating. Cat's going to jump out of her seat. So I reckon it's a bit this industry. Yeah. So I've seen on a, well, I've been working in London now for five years, um, full time before I started this degree. And so on a day to day basis, I've seen the battles that adults have trying to balance exercise with health living, with a job, with a family. And, well, I found recently, especially actually the younger, with um, teenagers and, and younger adults, you have this new watch, um, I don't know what it's called, is it Fitbit? Fit, 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 yeah. yeah, and that actually encourages them here, I, you know, it tells you if you've sat down too long to get up, and it'll tell you how many steps you've done and what your target mm -hmm. is, and also sleep and, yep. and, and the heart rate. And I think, again, we like visual um, goals, like that they should be used, yes. and, and as an adult, you know, they, they, they come with pride and say, oh, you know, I did this today, and I'm sure when I'm on their watch, there was an app maybe for children, I mean, I don't know, but... It's really, um, really, that? really interesting. I didn't talk about physical activity today because I understood the main thrust was more around nutrition, but the Disney piece of work that I talked about actually had, we had as part of that a um, Disney branded so uh, stopwatch, yeah, uh, which was which was very much, um, you know, in that, in, that, in that sort of vein, so... Uh, with adults, it is very interesting. I mean, I know that the Fitbits and Fitbugs and this, that and the other are all the rage. The, the challenge we've got with physical activity, and there's definitely a role for them, definitely, definitely. They're pretty expensive, so I can't go around sort of saying to, you know, my audiences, go and buy one. Um, the challenge we've got is that it's just about getting people up walking. Mm -hmm. And we've just done some research groups, actually, to, uh, amongst our mother, this is adult groups, but our most at-risk adult groups. Um, and they, uh, you know, you talk about 10,000 steps and you've got, you know, you've got it on your phone, you could do it, and they're going, oh my God, 10,000 steps, totally unachievable. Um, you know, didn't know I've got that on my phone, can't afford something like a Fitbit. You know, we, we, it's a real challenge we've got. So we are picking up on your point in particular, which is how important it is because it's part of the behaviour change to get people to set goals, to track, to play back their performance in a visual way. And so we're working on the moment of, on the development of an app, but a really, really simple one. Because you know, all the functionality with things like Fitbits, great, wonderful for people like you, but the people I'm trying to get just walking a little bit, it, it, it's I, A not affordable and B it's it's, it's way too much, you know, I just need to talk well, to the bus. We've talked about that before, it's, and it's the long-term motivation of it. It's great when it's a novelty, yeah. but the number of people I've seen with, you know, I'll oh, get an Apple Watch, and then after a month or so, you'll be sat with someone, and you'll be like, oh, what's that beeping for? Oh, I'm going to get up and walk around. But the thing was, okay, it's just so expensive. I, yeah. I like that aspect of, it, you know, it tells you to get up, stand yeah. up, and it, and it says, you know, it tells you some people are, aren't aware that they don't think that I haven't, I haven't walked anywhere today, but if there's something that you've It's brilliant. Day, I mean, I've spoken to them all and asked them, will they give us for free? Some of these, for, but I mean, they're expensive bits of yeah, kit. Yeah, I know. And um, so, and that's the, that's the, they're expensive bits of kit, and also some of our most at risk audience groups, I just need, yeah, I just need to get them up and walk, and you know, it's not about cycling and running, whatever. Yeah. Actually, that'd be perfect to one of those questions. Thank you very much. Um, the, you, you spoke about the, the accelerometer bags that you use with youngsters. Um, they should be tested in the summer months. Uh, it, with, it, we've done several bits of accelerometer yeah. again. Um, I was just wondering what the rationale was for that because my, my view would be that in the summer when kids are off school, they're generally going to be more active. The weather's nice. I was wondering if there's any bags available in the winter. There is, for example. and you are wrong. Interestingly, children are less active in the summer holidays than they are in in school. And there is lots and lots of research that says that. And that's the reason why we do what we do at the end of the school term, is we put it out, that Disney 10 minute shake up, goes out through schools at the end of the term, and it is a program to keep kids active during the summer. Um, because their loss of fitness from children between the end of the uh, summer term and the beginning of the autumn term is, is significant. And that is largely because, I mean, you know, they can't just pacify and sit in front of the telly you know, play computer games, whatever, they're not, they're not even doing the basics of, I've got to, you know, run around in the school playgrounds at lunchtime and break time. So it is surprising, but it is, there's lots of, of, of research that says that. I just wanted to say an idea for you, because I was thinking 
about uh, children education for a very long time. And I found that there are not many books which uh, in a very friendly uh, way explain to children what, how they need to eat, why it is important, what happens if they eat something which is not really good for them. And I just remember, it comes from my personal experience, I remember one of my kind of first books was about anatomy, how weird is that? But I remember I was so fascinated with all the platelets and all the kind of white blood cells and things like this when it was like a journey of a, um, you know, in your body. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed, um, I started to be very interested in this recently and I found that there are not many like visual books which would encourage you and inspire you to do this. But children are so, um, they're, they're very easy, if there is a really cool picture, they're really into it and it's very, uh, I find it uh, very easy to inspire them to do something after they were inspired by a book or mm. something like that. I think it's really interesting <laughs> and I agree with you and we're talking to Dorling and Kindersley and Disney actually about what we do in terms of publishing. Uh, and I think there's def that is definitely something we should be doing. It is kind of linked to another challenge I work on, which is literacy, actually, which is it would be lovely if parents were sitting down with their kids and reading to their kids, but that's, that's a story for another day. But I think, absolutely, there's definitely more that can be done there. Hey, well, thank you so much for your time today. And I think just another round of applause for James.